be here. I've never been to Plantation Church before. This is my first time here. But the church where, yeah, the church where I'm at is a lot of green and wooden colors as well. It's like Adventism has this thing about it that yeah. if, if yeah. we're going to build a temple, we're going to build it the same no matter where we're at. And so it's, it's really been great to be here. Honestly, I didn't think I was going to get here. Uh, it was, there was like a 53-minute slowdown on the turnpike. Um, and I was falling asleep, you know, you know, it was like bumper to bumper the entire time. I felt like my automatic transmission car was going to stall out. And, uh, and when I finally got here, um, I felt like this rush of energy because uh, you're so welcoming, you're so good, and um, you feel the, the love of Jesus. When you're in person here, you get to hug people, you get to say hello, you get to meet new faces. It's awesome. So you who are at home, you're welcome to stay home, but it's different here. It's nice here. And so I, I want to talk to you for a couple of minutes. They told me I have 55 minutes tops. Is a, a hope for healing. Hope for, I'm kidding. I, I speak for a very, very short amount of time. If you're passionate about young people, don't make it long. Just speak briefly and to the point. Um, so let me share a couple of things with you. This isn't uh, something repeated. I, I have Josie here. She'll keep me accountable. This is just for you. Hope for healing. I want to begin by saying that there is one place that I really dislike going to. And uh, I, maybe you've, you've heard of that question. Maybe Jennifer, Pastor Jennifer posted it at some point. Uh, if that there's a place that you go to where maybe you receive some help. Maybe you receive some advice. Maybe it's mom's house. <clears throat> and, but you really don't like going there. Uh, you go and you receive these things because you have to go, but you don't really like going there. And so this story is actually from last night. Uh, I came to this realization last night, so, so bear with me. There's one place I dislike to go to, and that is the hospital. I think everybody kind of dislikes going to the hospital, but, but I, I, I felt it really close last night. See, depending on your experience throughout life, you will most likely end up in a place where you're comfortable. And you're comfortable in that place because you are needed. You get to give help. You get to give advice. And given my profession, I, I, I like it because wherever I go, I'm either asked to pray or to bless someone's child or to do a baptism or whatever it may be. I'm asked to do something. I am needed. And I love that. So I'm comfortable in that. Perhaps you are a parent, right? And you feel like, oh, no, no, no one really needs me. But if you are somebody, if you're anybody, you are needed by someone. As a, as a parent, you're needed by your child for daily sustenance. As, as a husband or a wife, you're needed to comfort and to support. As a, as a person in a, in a romantic relationship, you are needed in order to be someone who your partner can lean on. If you're dating, you're looking for friendship. And so I believe that no matter where we are, we're constantly, or maybe subconsciously, looking for somewhere where we are needed, and environments where we are needed. So I dislike going to the hospital because last night I came to this realization, as I told you, and uh, I'm going to read this part because it's still very fresh, very new, and I don't want to miss anything. I dislike going to the hospital because last night I had a realization. As she was crying, going through the last of three major migraines in her life, the kind that paralyze you, listen, that overwhelm you with pain to the point that you vomit and your body begins to shake and, 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 and move, and the kind of pain in which your tears are not the product of the pain itself, but the result of loneliness in the pain that no one else in the room is going through, no one else in the room feels. The tears end up being the only comforting touch you receive coming from a place that truly knows the, what that pain is because it's coming from you. As I held my wife in her tears, I had no words of hope. No words for healing. I couldn't find them. So I drove us to the ER. And here comes the realization I have nothing to offer once we step into the ER. Last night, 10 p.m., nothing to offer 
when we stepped into the ER. The only thing I could do was fill out paperwork that I had to Google for, right? I don't, I don't know what my, uh, my, my doctor's uh, phone number is. Uh, I don't even know how to spell her name. Uh, uh, babe, what, what's the last four of your social? Husbands are really bad at knowing things. Like, I, I, I just noticed that, like, I didn't even know my wife's phone number. Like, I had to look her up on my contacts to get her phone number. And all, all these things, I think the only thing I knew was, like, her, her email address and things like that. Uh, but I didn't know a few things. we got to work on that, man. Uh, we are really poor at that. At least I am. I'll, I'll admit it. But I came to the realization that I had nothing to offer but information. In some moments, misinformation. They asked us, have you been out of country in the last 30 days? I was like, no. She was like, yeah, we went on vacation. For this. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. We, we, we've been out of it. And, and, and so in that moment, I had nothing to offer. Very little information. And so they take their, her vitals, and the doctor comes in and asks questions that I can actually answer and, and show proof of because I, I brought it in my book back with me. And, and, and he steps out, and the nurse, then he takes over again, and, and he has my wife. He ushers her into a room where, where they're treating other patients. And then he says these famous words, patients only. You're not allowed past this point. And so the door closes and I'm like, uh, well, can you take her, her water bottle? No, nothing. And so I have to come out back to the lobby and sit, and I have nothing to contribute to the wellness of my wife. All I can do is sit there and pray because I tell others to pray. No control whatsoever. And so you begin to think about this, the sense of, of what we're talking about this entire week. Jesus at the center of things. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of my life. That there's a hope for healing. But you go through these moments where you start thinking, is there truly, really hope? Perhaps you're here this evening or you're listening online this evening because there's a crippling pain, an event or situation that devastated you. Perhaps you become pressed by your anxieties, by the pressures of the world, what stresses you out, and you don't know how to find that way forward. You can't see the way out. Perhaps you can't see a way, period. No control. There's a thing about um, these severe headaches, right, these migraines, and it's, it typically affects your eyesight in some way. Uh, either you begin to see blurry or you can't see at all. And, and so the, the sense of, of migraine brought me nearer to a story, to a story that I wasn't originally going to share, but I think it's the most prudent one now found in Luke chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, verse 35 now, Luke is my favorite gospel. Josie knows this because I say every time I preach from it. Luke is my favorite gospel because it's a man that writes about something that he wasn't really there for. Luke never met Jesus, and yet he writes his entire story. Luke never got to speak to Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. He never got to have breakfast with Jesus. He, he didn't have any of that. But he's one of our main gospel writers where he went out and he asked questions and he inquired about Jesus and he wanted to know more about the life of Jesus. And then he wanted to write it down so he could share with his other friend about who Jesus is. And I believe that that is our context today, that we are more like Luke in the sense that we've never seen perhaps Jesus face to face, but we can sure write a story about what he's done in our lives and the lives of others. So I love Luke. I love Luke because of that, because it's the person I relate to the most in the Gospels as he's writing. And so in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 35, we're going to read through that very quickly. It says, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside, begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. So they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, man. So he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. With more of an exclamation point, I have a monotone voice, but you, you get it. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. 
Shut up, they said, shouted all, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he replied, I want to see. I want to see. So Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has done what? Healed you, restored you, whatever version you have. And it says there that immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also did what? Praised God. So I, I love the, the gospel of Luke because that he is so personal about what he writes. He writes facts. He doesn't call it the Sea of Galilee. No, it's a lake. It's a lake of Galilee. I, I, I like that. He's straightforward, and he tells it how it is. And so in this story, he goes straight to the point, because other gospels talk about it too. They give the blind man a name and all this other stuff, but he goes to the point. He says this, and these are the points that I want us to bring about today, and the ones that I wanted to highlight is the conversation that happens between him and Jesus. It says that Jesus l literally stopped. And perhaps you don't understand the, 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 the profound nature of this because you're thinking that Jesus is just on this natural journey, right? It's not that he was walking into Burger 5, but his friends were behind him, and so he stops so that they can catch up so they can all order together. He wasn't walking into Denny's or Chick-fil-A or anything like that. What he was doing was he was walking on his way to save the world. He was on his way to Jerusalem. He was on his way to be crucified, and he had to go through Jericho at that precise moment. And when he was going through, about to go through Jericho, um, he meets this guy, and he decides to stop for him. It's not like, oh man, now our order is going to take another half hour to eat. It was, oh man, he's putting the, sa the salvation of the world on pause for this one person. That's a personable God. That's a God that we can go to because he takes value in those personal moments that we spend with him. Perhaps you're, you're, you're not a Christian, and, and, and maybe if you are, you're not accustomed to someone literally stopping the most important thing that they have in their day to speak with you. Some of you are spouses, and that doesn't happen. There are times where we see this behavior of Jesus, and I think it's congruent through all, all of Scripture, where he stops and has personal conversations with people. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. He, <laughs> and then he answers, I think it's interesting that we talk about hope. We talk about hope for healing, right? That's our, our thing um, for tonight. Um, but oftentimes we try to introduce hope to people, right? We're like, oh, this is something that you should be hopeful about. But we never take the time to really ask them, right? Inquire, uh, uh, hey, you know, wh wh what's going on? Wh what do you need? And, and we never really know how to really offer hope for people. We just assume that because... Why? Well, since I experienced salvation through, through the word and through baptism and through the church, then you too need salvation. So here you go, hope for salvation. And maybe they don't need salvation or they don't feel like they need salvation. Maybe they feel like they need empowerment. Maybe they feel like they need assurance. Maybe they feel like they need someone to befriend and that is all. And so to, in order for us to actually give hope to people, we have to be able to ask questions. Um, I think religions are famously known for telling people how to best live their lives and how to best acquire some kind of peace, but I love the fact that the Bible is constantly pushing us, challenging us to ask questions, because God wants to know what you're hopeful for. And so here, he asked this question, right? What do, you want to, what do you want me to do for you? And he responds, Lord, I want to see. 
Perhaps you don't understand, but, the, but the, his response, it presumes that Jesus, one, is the son of David because he calls him that. But two, because he's the son of David, then he has the power to heal him. It, it only presumes that. He doesn't literally say that, but the way that it is structured presumes that Jesus has the power to do that. How many times do we go and pray and we say, God, you know, if you can, I don't know if you're powerful. Enough. I don't know if you want to intercede in this situation, but he does. If you ask him, straightforward. If you believe that he can, but many of us go to prayer because it's something that we are taught to do, not something that we believe that God can work through. And so when we're coming into Christianity, perhaps you're not Adventist, you're not Christian, and, and Jesus being the center of it all is kind of weird to you. That's okay. We're all learning together because those of us who have been in Christianity for the last 30 years are still trying to wrestle and understand what it means to have Jesus in the center of our hearts. We can go through that journey together. Don't worry. You don't need to know all the answers. In fact, the more questions you have, the better. He presumes that Jesus has the power to heal his sight. What's crazy, though, is that in Jesus asking him this, he is making him do something that is out of the ordinary for many of us. And it is to proclaim his need and his faith in front of the entire crowd that was gathered. It, he requires him to state his faith publicly. That's kind of difficult. It's very difficult. I, I was hoping that in, in being close to my wife and, and hearing her pain and trying to soothe her in any way I could and giving her the medication that we had that that it would soothe her pain, that she would fall asleep and wake up better the next morning. That's what I was hoping for. But entering the ER meant that the person that I feel I am, the person that, that is typically the one being called into hospital rooms to pray over people, is now walking into one saying, I have nothing left to give. You have to take care of this for me. And so here we see that it requires, a, <laughs> it requires a, 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 him to state his faith publicly. It requires me to enter into the ER for everybody who is there to know that I can't solve this problem. We, though we tried, cannot solve what's going on. She needs expertise that's above me, above what I can offer. So Jesus provides both physical healing and salvation I want to read to you a, um, a quote by an author that I'm reading. His name is A.W. Tozer. He's a pretty popular Christian author. He's no longer with us, but he wrote this in his book, The Pursuit of God, and it, and it touched me, especially for tonight. He says, faith is not in itself a meritorious act. There's no merit in it. The merit is in the one toward whom it is directed. Faith is redirecting of sight, a getting out of focus of our own vision and getting God into focus. See, sin has twisted our vision inward and made it self-regarding, but unbelief has put self where God should be. And it is perilously close, perilously close to the sin of Lucifer who said, I will set my throne above the throne of God. And he ends with this, faith looks out instead of in, and the whole life falls into line. See, I think that many times we are like what I just experienced last night. We look inward. How can I solve this? How can I do this? How can I try all these uh, practical remedies to heal myself? How can I work out harder to lower my cholesterol? How can I? Yes, there are things that you can do. There are things that you can do, but at the end of the day, man, there's no one better to take care of us. There's no one better to have hope in than our creator, Jesus. Faith looks out instead of in, and the whole life falls in line to that. Walking into the ER again was equivalent to me to stepping into a public forum where I agreed that got nothing left. 
there's nothing that I can do. I'm not able to deal with the problem. I need help. I need assistance. I need guidance. My hope cannot come from within. It has to come from an external source. So as they closed the doors and I could not see what was happening to my wife, all I could do is trust that what was happening behind those doors would work. That's it. I had nothing left to do. And this is where the next story is so impactful, and I'm almost done. And the next chapter, and we're not going to read it, but in the next chapter, if we, do we give homework out here? I don't, I don't know. But in the next chapter, chapter, <laughs> chapter, chapter 19, it talks about this famous little man. His name is Zacchaeus. And he had the same issue that this blind man has. He couldn't see Jesus, right? And his for him, it was because he was short, and there was an entire crowd there. But he couldn't see Jesus. And in that story of Zacchaeus, what we learn is that this chapter 19, ending with the blind man, and then entering into the story of Zacchaeus, what we see is the, fo- is the following. It reveals to us a fundamental truth. Are you ready? That in our hope for healing, not being able to see Jesus is far more serious than not being able to see at all. So what that means for us, as we're talking about hope for healing, what it means for us is that, yes, we want to experience healing. Yes, we want to experience restoration. Yes, we want to get to a place where where we are healthy, both emotionally, physically, and also spiritually. But what's most important, it seems, here from the gospel It's not that the man received his sight, it's that the man was able to see Jesus. That Zacchaeus, though he had sight, though he had everything, he was a wealthy man, could not see Jesus. So bottom line that I want to share with you is that Jesus is the Messiah who brings recovery of sight to the blind and sets free oppressed. But their hearts must be prepared to see who Jesus is in order to be healed by his power. While I was sitting sitting there in the lobby waiting, hopefully, for my wife to get a, a room so that I could go in with her, I remember thinking about this, hope for healing, and I was like, man, I've never been so close in empathy to needing so much hope. See, sometimes the need of hope can be masked with knowledge. Oh, I I know things. Um, I know biblical truths. And those things mask my need of hope for a savior, my need of hope for someone to bring healing in my life and in the life of my wife. It's in those dark moments that I believe that God is most at work. And sometimes we see doors shut where we can't see what's beyond that, and we begin to freak out. Like, man, I'm so anxious, I'm so stressed, I'm so depressed, I'm so... And all those are valuable. I'm not diminishing your pain. Because we can't see beyond that. We, we have to rely on some external source to keep walking, to keep moving, to keep advancing. And for me, when I couldn't see that, my biggest hope for healing was to let go. My biggest hope for healing was to know that there was someone who was better than me to take care of the situation. So perhaps, I don't know, if if you're at home sitting on your couch, on your bed, or just, you know, eating, you have it on your computer, I don't know. Maybe you're driving, I hope you're not driving. And you're, you feel stuck. You feel blind to the activities of God around you. You feel alone. You feel like perhaps, <laughs> perhaps God, God doesn't love you or isn't working in your favor or ha- because he hasn't healed you. He hasn't turned up for you. I encourage you, unless you're driving, <laughs> to close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. Let's, let's close our eyes right now. And understand this, that faith works in places where we don't see. 
that taking the first step is exactly that, taking one step at a time. That the Bible calls the Word of God a lamp unto our feet because we're not supposed to know the entire way. We're just supposed to know where our footing should be. It's not a flashlight. And so, whatever it is that you're holding on to, whatever problem it is that you're going through, right now, take the time to live that in your mind. Just remember it for a moment and give it to Jesus. What that may look like, it may look like closing, clenching your fist and just releasing that grip. What it may look like is standing up from wherever you are and just opening your arms and say, take it. Maybe your burden is elsewhere. You can open your eyes now. Maybe your burden is elsewhere. Maybe your burden is like, I don't know the meaning for my life. I don't know what to, what to do. I don't know where to go. I invite you to say that Jesus might be the first person to talk to about that. Jesus is the first person to ask this man the question, what do you want? Before, it was just the man saying, who, who is coming? And relying on the same people who told him to shut up to bring him to Jesus. So here, I invite you, whatever you may have in your heart, I believe that Jesus is the answer to that. At least part of the beginning of the solution to that. And you can be ushered into a family full of people that will love, not perfect, but will love and support you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, healing doesn't happen as we want it to. Healing doesn't occur uh, sometimes when, when we pray to you. And that can be frustrating. Why did I have to go to the ER to experience healing? Why couldn't my faith and my prayer walk with you be enough? God, we encounter such questions, Lord, and we bring them before you because I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer to the illnesses that we live in this world with. I don't have the compassion that you have. And so, God, as, as we're going through this healing process, Maybe we're going through some kind of serious illness where we require chemotherapy or maybe we're, we're going through a surgery or maybe you're going through the healing process of a broken relationship, of a broken religion. God, we know that you are the beginning and the end of the things that we seek. And so we place them in your hands tonight. It is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.